Hey everyone, welcome to week 75. Today is Wednesday. Today is the third day of our ongoing Villains Week. And on Monday, we painted Dark Side. Tuesday, for Spanish Tuesdays, Martes de Español, we painted Monsieur Thenardier from Les Miserables. And today, well, it's going to be a villain from probably the most horrific movie ever. We'll see how we're going to do. Okay, let's get started. Uh, this is day three. This is our third day on our Villains Week. And we started with comic books where I painted the over-the-top new god that is Darkseid. Yesterday, we turned to literature to try to find a memorable villain in my own history. And I had a few runners-up in my brain, but nothing, I think, compares to Les Miserables and the horrible family that were the Thénardier. And Monsieur Thénardier is just evil incarnate. I had a hard time even reading this book because of him. I couldn't even accept the fact that he was astute. I just thought he was a piece of trash. He was a horrible human being. And it was incredibly frustrating to see that time and again, he would end up unharmed regardless of him being caught in the act of whatever he was doing, just lying, scheming, trying to kill somebody. I mean, he's a horrendous human being, but his story is so well-written and obviously intertwined with all the other characters that are part of Les Miserables. I think the first time I read that book was maybe 25 years ago. I still carry that first reading of that book with me, and the impression that I had when I read about the Thénardier, nothing has changed. Honestly, nothing has changed. I mean, they are, like I said, evil incarnate. And I was saying yesterday how tough it was for me because I was trying to remember if while I was reading for the first time Les Miserables, I had formed an image of what Thénardier looked like. And I don't know. I'm not entirely sure if I did. But unfortunately, and I'm going to say unfortunately, I do have visual representations of different interpretations of Thénardier because I saw him portrayed in a musical. I watched two movies and I watched a miniseries. So I do have an idea of how he's been portrayed throughout the years. But I was trying to see if I could tap into the feeling that I have of him instead of just relying upon all the pieces of these visual puzzles that also are part of my memory of him. So it was pretty cool. It was really exciting to try and see how I kept a lot of the things that I remember of the movie representations of Thénardier, but also the things that were harder to grasp that have to do with how I feel about him. And, and what I was trying to get through yesterday was the fact that he is a facade, that there's nothing true or real about him. And I'm sorry, but I never felt an ounce of compassion for the Thénardiers. I never did. I never did. I thought uh, Monsieur and Madame Thénardier were just horrendous human beings. Horrendous human beings. So I was trying to get some of that, but I also think their humanity has been stripped away. So I have these very conflicting feelings of how I view them, and I was trying to make a visual representation of that. So that's why I think I landed on a character that seems more like a scarecrow. It seems like empty, absolutely empty inside. It's just a shell of a human being. So I was pretty happy with that. I struggled a lot yesterday. I had to paint and repaint and scrape and repaint. It was very, very frustrating. The reason I scraped and repainted was because I didn't think I was getting to this very abstract idea of what I wanted with Thénardier. What I noticed that I was doing was just trying to paint a portrait, trying to model a portrait. And I didn't feel that that was enough. I felt that it had to feel somehow deformed. This is not how I would depict a human being because I really felt that, like I said, there's no humanity in him. So why would I paint him? Why would I model him like I would a human being? And that's why I struggled a bit. But I think that only in the end, I felt that the painting came together. You know, it's one of those paintings that, oh, it just kills you while you're painting because you're not able to see progression. Nothing in the painting is telling you that you're doing the right thing, that you're pushing forward towards the idea that you wanted to depict. Nothing. It's almost like the last five minutes of the painting are like, okay, we're there. But the rest of the four or five hours that you've spent painting it, 
It's all darkness. It's all an act of faith. So I was very happy with yesterday's painting, but oof, I mean, it's very draining to paint like that for sure. I was happy that today, that for today, I was going to go for something that is very explicit, that needs no explanation, that is just a single feeling, a single emotion. It comes from a specific sequence. If yesterday I had uncertainty, today I have no doubt. There is no doubt in my mind, no doubt in my body. The painting is simple. The painting is direct. There is a sort of tamed, feral quality. I mean, obviously in the end, it's demonic. You're trying to paint a, a spawn from hell. But it was very concrete. So I'm sure that a lot of people, a lot of people, as soon as I started drawing, they were like, okay, we know this exact sequence. We know this exact shot. This is horrifying. I'm positive that a lot of people already knew from the moment that I started to compose the image what the painting was going to be. But let me give you a little bit of background. I've never been a big fan of horror movies. I don't really enjoy them. I don't think that I'm scared, which I, I probably am, but I don't know if I enjoy jump scares. I don't know if I like that feeling. A lot of people love that feeling. They thrive on that feeling. They love to go to theaters to watch scary movies. I really don't. I really don't. I much rather watch something suspenseful or like a thriller, and I enjoy those a lot more. Like, I feel that with a good suspense movie, with a good thriller, I'm going to be completely invested and I'm glued to the screen. What happens usually with horror movies, with terror in cinema, is that I just kind of want to look away. So I'm finding ways to not be invested in the movie. So I'm probably not a good audience for a horror movie, for sure. But having said that, when we were little, and I remember very clearly... In Colombian television on Channel 1, it was Wednesday nights, they had what was called in Spanish, Cita con los Clásicos. So, date with the classics. But eventually, they changed it to Cita con los Clásicos del Terror, which was date with the horror classics, with the terror classics. So, a lot of those movies were Vincent Price movies, Roger Corman movies, cinema classics of horror and terror. It was super cool. So informally, it was called like Wednesdays of Terror because you knew that every Wednesday at 8 p.m. you would watch a horror movie. That was a certainty. And me and my sister, when we were little, I mean, this was 81 to 83. So I was four, <laughs> from four to seven years old, <laughs> which is not the age to watch these movies. Me and my sister, Kata, who is three or four years older than me, we would watch these movies, and they were horrifying. For us, they were absolutely horrifying, but we were glued to the TV. We loved watching those movies. And I guess at some point, at some point, they showed The Omen. Sometimes those 60s horror movies can be a little bit campy, a little bit cheesy. So they're somehow digestible. You know, they're so over the top that you go like, okay, this is kind of watchable. And especially like if you're a five, six, seven year old kid, you can try to rationalize those movies. But when we saw the 1976 Omen, I mean, it just really, really felt different. After the movie, I remember with my sister, we started looking at our scalp because we wanted to see if maybe one of us was the Antichrist. And I remember with the friends that I had in school, I was just fascinated thinking that for sure there had to be a kid somewhere that had moles on the shape of 666. And it was just a matter of, you know, brushing their hair back and inspecting their scalp. And I was going to eventually find the Antichrist among the people that I knew. You know, it was almost like certainty. So. That was the aftermath of that movie. But watching that movie, oh my God. And this is terrible, but I don't think I watched it just once. I'm pretty certain that we watched it a lot more times. And I'm pretty sure some of those times I watched it with my parents. I am certain that my mother and my father were there and we were there as a family watching The Omen. Probably had like a five-year-old, an eight-year-old, and my brother was probably like 12. And we were all a happy family just watching The Omen. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. I have no idea how they allowed parents to do that. I have no idea how they didn't even realize that we weren't supposed to be watching these things. But 
This one particular sequence always stuck in my brain. We've been talking about things that are etched in our brains. Even though they are distorted memories, they will remain with us until the day we die. And this particular sequence, the sequence of Mrs. Baylock, who is portrayed masterfully, I think, by Billy Whitelaw, where she appears in the hospital at night, throws Catherine out the hospital window. She screams for what I thought was like 10 minutes straight as she falls down. And she just crash lands into this ambulance, cracking open the two back doors. And then you get a shot of her. I mean, a horrific shot of her just lying there. Absolutely horrible. That sequence is just horror made movie. Because you've already been introduced to Mrs. Baylock and you already know, you know that she is a demonic guardian. I mean, you know that Satan put her there to protect Damien. You know, that was her only job. And she is just perfect. She's just this perfect character, a perfect portrayal. And this particular shot, when she's introduced, you know there's something off with her. You know that this woman was just absolute evil. But she's so contained that it's only, it's only until this sequence that you realize, oh my God, she does come from hell. Like I said, for me, this sequence has to be one of the most famous, most powerful sequences in all of horror movies. I think it's absolutely perfect. The way that they shot her close up, because Catherine is trying to take her robe off, I think. So the robe is kind of blocking and filtering what she sees. And I love, I love that when I was able to watch this movie again, after many years, by the way, many, many years, because for the longest time, I was like, I'm not watching that movie ever again. Forget it. I mean, I watched it when I was a little kid. We've already established that I probably watched it somewhere between four to seven years old. So this is not right. I mean, Damien was my contemporary. Damien was a kid my age. That's how insane this is. But I told myself, I'm never going to watch this movie again. Forget it. If I've been scarred once, why do I need to deepen this scar? Like, this is completely unnecessary. But at some point, I thought, you know what? I'm a grown up. I can convince myself that I'm watching a movie. This is Gregory Peck. This is an actor. This is a dumb story. I have no idea what happened to Damien. I don't even know who the actor was. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to look for that. I'm not being disrespectful. It's just that, I don't know. I need some distance. I really need some distance. But I told myself, I'm a grown-up. Apparently not so much. If I'm not able to look for information regarding who the actor was that played Damien. But I told myself, I can watch this again. And I watched the uh, 2.35 to 1 ratio that the movie was shot in. And it was really nice because I think that, like most people, I saw this on TV, so it was heavily cropped. I remember just watching that sequence at 2.35 to 1 was incredible. Absolutely incredible. I thought it was brilliant. I really still believe that it is one of the scariest moments in all of film history. In all of film history. I think it's perfect. I think the character is perfect. I think that close-up has to be one of the most famous close-ups in all of movie history. I think that scream, like I said, you know, that scream that goes on for an eternity is hauntingly perfect. And then, you know, as the doors crack open of the ambulance, the shot of her lying inside is just this amazing culmination. Close-up was amazing. The lighting was amazing. The way, you know, the robe kind of filters the information and she knows immediately that she's going to die because what the hell is the nanny doing there the way the ambulance siren is going and then it kind of matches the scream uh the crash into the ambulance and then finally the presentation of the body in the ambulance i mean it is horrifying it is absolutely horrifying i hope that there's more people out there that feel that this is something as powerful as it was for me I mean, I'm describing it as powerful, but again, it is one of the darkest, most horrifying moments of my life. I am holding my parents responsible. I have no idea how they had five kids. Five? Five? And you let like a five-year-old and an eight-year-old just watch these movies, these horror movies? Irresponsible. Absolutely irresponsible. Not like me nowadays. Fed has an iPad and pretty much can watch anything. So 
In hindsight, not many things have changed, to be honest. But again, I wanted to paint this. I wanted to acknowledge the stretched format because I think it's fantastic. And initially, I thought that I was going to do a very careful portrait of um, Miss Baylock. But when I started painting, I was like, no, this has to be expressive. This has to be bolder because she is a beast. There is no way, no way in hell that I'm going to paint her sensibly. I just have to put paint down, move paint around. And as soon as she's there, as soon as her essence is there, I was like, okay, I'm done. I can't paint this for any longer. I'm trying to see if I exercised this memory through painting. I don't think it worked. I think this is the first tattoo that I ever had in my life and it's in my brain, but I give it a shot. So for today, nothing in my history was more powerful or could compare with Miss Baylock and that sequence where she pushes Catherine out the window in the hospital. Nothing. Nothing. I've watched a ton of movies. I love watching movies. No way that any other character comes close to the evil, pure evil that Miss Baylock is. So that's going to be it for today. I thought this was a no-brainer. I hope a lot of you guys went like, oh yeah, you know, no doubt. No doubt about who this character is and why she is just the most magnificent villain, the most horrible, horrible creature to have ever been part of a movie. Join us tomorrow. We're going to take a lighter touch and we're going to do something completely, completely different because we have to turn the page. We can't just stay with this image. So we're going to do something completely different, a character that I really despise, but I also have enormous fascination for. But that's going to be tomorrow where we examine an incredible villain in animation history. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. Love you guys. Bye.